Welcome to Healthy Births, Happy Babies, where we share tips, tools, and stories grounded in natural childbirth and parenting principles, so that instead of feeling overwhelmed and confused during this exciting time in your life, you feel safe, supported, and empowered in your childbirth and parenting journey. And now, here's your host, Dr. Jay Warren. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Healthy Births, Happy Babies. I'm Dr. Jay Warren. I'm the prenatal and pediatric chiropractor here at the Cap Wellness Center. And today's guest is Nancy Moorbacher. She's the author of the book, Breastfeeding Made Simple. And the principles in this book are really what we base our own Breastfeeding 101 class that we teach here at the center. So I'm really excited to have her here to explain the principles in this book. Um, She's looked cross-culturally around the world at how moms best breastfeed and also looking at how babies best breastfeed, Uh, looking at the neurological impulses and reflexes that babies are hardwired with and how newborns best breastfeed and then being able to teach moms these things allows both of them to be much more successful, especially in those first couple weeks when it can be challenging. Um, But knowing these um, tips and tools and the way that breastfeeding most naturally works will allow moms to be much more successful. So before we get into our conversation, let me, as always, take a moment to take a word from our sponsor, the Cap Wellness Center. Hi, it's Dr. J, and one of the things I love about working at the Cap Wellness Center is being able to play a role in bringing a baby into the world that much more safely, much more naturally, and much more healthy. You know, it's something that is an amazing gift to give a child uh, to have them start off their life healthy without the stress and the trauma that can all too often be a part of the birth experience. So I consider it an honor to work with pregnant women to help them with that time during their pregnancy. And it is a privilege to be able to work with infants and help correct any distortions that might have happened through the birth process and allow them to start off their life healthy in alignment and in balance so that a health challenge doesn't hold them back from being all that they can be in this world. All right, and I want to take a moment to thank all of you who've written uh, reviews in iTunes for us. It, It really means a lot. I want to share a couple that have just come in recently. One here is from Brittany, and she says, I can't get enough of this podcast. It's a blessing to have people like Dr. J sharing factual, relevant, and enlightening information to help parents make the best and most informed decisions for themselves and family. I look forward to each new podcast. No matter where you are in your parenting journey, this podcast is a must. Thank you for that, Brittany. And this one from Becky. I explored lots of pregnancy podcasts since becoming pregnant with my first, and this one has been my favorite. The host and the guests are all knowledgeable and well-spoken. My husband and I have been interested in natural home birth, but as I look up online any pregnancy symptom or lack of symptom, I'm overcome with nervousness, which is unusual for me. Listening to this podcast puts me at ease, reminding me of the intelligence of my body for giving birth. I'd recommend this to anyone interested in natural birth, or even if you aren't planning on having a natural birth, I believe this podcast is empowering and informative. So thank you. That's exactly what we're wanting to do with this podcast. And so I thank you. It's always great to hear um, that feedback uh, that we're making a difference here with the content we're putting out. But then also it really helps other parents out there that might be scrolling through the podcast sphere looking for information um, during their pregnancy or getting ready for their birth or um, heading into postpartum or parenting. And to be able to see reviews like this allows them to much more likely jump in and scroll through our episodes. So again, thank you to Becky. Thank you to Brittany and to all of the other people that have written reviews. And if you haven't done so already, I really encourage you to do that. You can do that in iTunes. So now let me take a moment to introduce our guest and then we'll get into our conversation. So Nancy Moorbacher is born and raised in the Chicago area. She's a board-certified lactation consultant who's been helping nursing mothers since 1982. Her breastfeeding books for parents and professionals include Breastfeeding Made Simple, written with Kathleen Kendall Tackett. She's been a guest on our podcast as well. Working and Breastfeeding Made Simple, and also Breastfeeding Solutions and its companion app for Android and iPhone. We're going to be talking about that app 
uh, in our conversation for sure. Nancy currently contracts with hospitals to improve breastfeeding practices, writes for many publications, and speaks at events around the world. Nancy was in the first group of 16 to be honored for her contributions to breastfeeding with the designation FILCA, Fellow of the International Lactation Consultant Association. With her very, very busy international uh, teaching schedule, we're very lucky to have her. It took us a couple of months to coordinate our schedules, uh, so I'm really excited to switch over to my conversation with Nancy Moorbacher. All right, Nancy, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Jay. It's a- yeah, and it's it's a great to have you on our podcast because, I mean, your books and your work is really well known in our center here at the Capuano Center, um, the breastfeeding um, support group that we have weekly here, as well as um, as well as our classes that we teach on breastfeeding incorporate um, principles in your work. So I just want to, in advance, thank you for the work that you've done, and then now thanking you for taking the time to share that information with our listeners. You're most welcome. Yeah. So tell me, you know, we just, our listeners just heard your bio and, you know, about your books that you've written and um, what you're currently working on. But take us a little um, back further about like how you got interested in being a lactation consultant and doing the work that you're doing now. Well, that's, that's That's a really good question. question. Uh, Back when I started out, I will say, first of all, I'm probably quite a bit older than most of your listeners. Um, I, I had my first baby in 1980 Hmm. and I was, uh, at the time I had just, uh, decided I was going to stay home with my baby and I got involved with a local, uh, breastfeeding support group. Uh, I started going to meetings before my first child was born and I, I was looking for a way to, to find, uh, I guess an intellectual stimulation that was comparable to what I had in the workplace before. And I got really interested in breastfeeding and not just interested on an intellectual level. I really fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember the first meeting I went to where I saw a mother interacting with her three week old baby girl. And I was just totally uh, enthralled with watching them because it was clear to me that they had a really strong emotional relationship. And I never realized that a newborn could could have that with with anyone. I always thought my parents used to say, oh, they're just, newborns are just a massive reflexes. And mm. and so I, I kind of fell in love with breastfeeding at the very first meeting. And at the time, there were no lactation consultants. Uh, the lactation consultant profession didn't start until 1985. And so during the first years that I got involved with breastfeeding, really all there were were volunteers. And so I decided there was a very strong need for for this kind of work because there were many mothers who were trying to breastfeed who were not meeting their breastfeeding goals. And so I, because I fell in love with it and I really wanted every woman who wanted to breastfeed to be successful, I decided I would throw myself into it. And so it was, uh, I became accredited as a breastfeeding support counselor in 1982. And then later in 1991, I did go on to to become board certified as a lactation consultant. It took me actually a few years. I was sort of in protest with the idea that this was a paid profession. It seemed like something, um, no pun intended, that should be given with the milk of human kindness. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so after a while, I began to realize, well, you know, mothers really do need help in the hospital. And yes, I guess it does need to be a paid profession. And so I came around to it after a while and I I became board certified and opened a large private practice in the Chicago area where I worked with thousands of families. And, uh, you know, one thing led to another. I had a background in publishing. And so I started writing and I had a co-author who was very into the breastfeeding research. And that kind of led me down the path to to start uh, trying to put together resources that I felt were really mom friendly uh, and easy for them to understand breastfeeding because there's so much confusion about it. And then that also led me into writing books for professionals that were evidence-based and, and fully referenced. So I basically do both of those things. Right. And I can say that the moms uh, that have used your work, it, it is very mom-friendly and gives great tools as far as the breastfeeding made simple and even your app um, that you have. Oh, and maybe we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. But, you know, in... 
the first weeks breastfeeding a lot of the moms that are listening to the show and as well as we take care are like they really want to be breastfeeding uh their kiddos and have a goal to do it for a long time but they're challenges of course yes. and so a lot of your work helps one make it simple but also like what to look for so that it can be an easier start so when you're talking with a new a new mama that's um, breastfeeding where do you usually start with them to help them have an easier start well, one of the things that I learned um, about eight years ago, I read a research paper that totally changed my mind about uh, the early positioning that we use with breastfeeding. And what the researcher did was she she and her team uh, videotaped 40 mother-baby pairs. Uh, they were from two different countries to try to eliminate cultural differences. And they analyzed the movements of the baby. And they... they uh, came up with these 20 what they called primitive neonatal reflexes that were involved with infant feeding. And we, we knew, of course, that babies had feeding reflexes. Many of your listeners have probably are familiar with the, the concept of the breast, uh, the breast crawl after birth, which is when a baby's put tummy down on mother's body and the baby can actually make their own way up to the breast and latch on. You know, we already knew this when this research uh, study was published, but what I hadn't thought about until I read the results was that actually our babies do come fully hardwired and ready to, to breastfeed um, in a way that mothers aren't necessarily, you know, we think of breastfeeding as, as a learned skill for mothers. And what we've done in past, uh, past decades is we've been teaching mothers positions to use for early breastfeeding that involve fighting gravity. And it, they actually make it impossible for babies to do what they've come fully equipped to do after birth. So, so this study really changed how I thought about early positioning. And, um, for example, I have a YouTube channel that has uh, short videos uh, showing mothers using the, the, uh, what we call the natural breastfeeding positions uh, as a way to help prevent many of the early problems. And what I found as I've used it with moms, because I'm still – involved with mother-to-mother -mother support is that the, the three most common breastfeeding problems that mothers have, which are nipple pain and trauma, worries about milk, milk production and latching struggles, actually can often be completely prevented or solved simply by adjusting positioning so that the baby takes a more active role in going to the breast. So what, are the, what kind of positions are those? Well, if you think about the breast crawl, after birth, what's happening there is that the mother's leaning back and the baby is resting tummy down on her body, fully resting. So in other words, the mother's not holding the baby in her arms, but rather the baby is resting on her body. And so um, the way these positions work is the mother leans back and puts the baby tummy down on her. And she needs to be leaning back far enough so that if she were to remove her arms, the baby would stay in place. So in other words, she's not using her arms to hold the baby or to push the baby on the breast. Uh, she's really just using her arms more like a nest, and the baby's head rests oftentimes on the mother's upper arm uh, during breastfeeding so that the nose can tilt away. Uh, but it's, it's one where the baby actually has the responsibility for latching on, and the mother basically is just a support for the baby. Versus the traditional kind of cradle position, right? That right. Most for, moms for, tend to for, go to. for the first uh, twenty years or so that I was in breastfeeding, we not only taught positions like that, we gave them names, and we at the breastfeeding classes used to say, you know, this is the cradle, this is the cross cradle, this is the football hold, this is the sideline position, but. You know, I begin to understand that actually those positions, while they're perfectly good, once a baby gets head and neck control after about six weeks or so, in the beginning, they actually can be at the source of a lot of the problems that mothers and babies are having. And that's because mothers, you know, essentially when they start off breastfeeding, they really are not sure what needs to happen, whereas babies actually know. Hmm. So it becomes the baby's leading the education right. process rather than moms needing to figure something out. Right. And as a matter of fact, you know, when I used to teach moms, because, you know, that's how I started was teaching those kinds of positions. Um, almost every breastfeeding problem usually came back to making some adjustments there. And it did require a lot of instruction. There were many steps. You know, mothers often talked about how complicated 
early breastfeeding was. And the only reason it was so complicated is because mothers were fighting gravity and they had to develop certain physical skills to get their babies latched on deeply, which is what um, prevented and helped them overcome nipple pain and trauma. It's, it was the shallow latch that babies had that were causing that. And the shallow latch was happening because the those kind of primitive... Uh, reflexes weren't being stimulated properly or the baby just their hard wiring wasn't able to be activated? Is that how Well, it works? the baby actually couldn't do much to, to help with latching in those positions. It was a little bit like trying to climb Mount Everest. I mean, there was just no way that a baby could get to the breast on their own in those positions. Um, and what a mother had to do was the mother had to be completely responsible for, for um, you know, first of all, triggering an open mouth and then getting her baby on deeply enough so that the nipple went back into what, what we call the comfort zone or the place in the baby's mouth where there's no friction or pressure. Now, what, what happens during breastfeeding when you're in a sitting up position is that there's hormones that are released. One of them is called oxytocin, and it actually relaxes a, a mother's muscles. And so even if she gets a baby latched on deeply in the beginning, even if she develops that skill and is able to do it, as the feeding goes on, her muscles begin to relax and the baby often pulls down into a more shallow latch over time. Whereas if the mother's leaning back and the baby is coming from on top, then not only does the baby usually latch on deeper to start with, but as the feeding progresses, they actually get on deeper and deeper instead of shallower and shallower. Hmm. And so then like the, the issues with the, the latching and the, the nipple pain can more help be helped, but then how does that affect right. the milk production issue? Well, if you're a mother and you're holding a baby in your arms, um, even a seven pound baby or a baby who's smaller than that, over time they get very heavy and it, it, it becomes you know, burdensome to hold them up. Uh, you know, it's very hard to find a pillow that's exactly the right height to fully support your baby's weight at the, at the right level. And so mothers often ask the question, how many minutes do I have to do this? Because it's, it's a strain. And oftentimes mothers who are sitting up straight have hunched shoulders. Uh, as a chiropractor, I'm sure, sure you've seen many mothers who have neck pain and shoulder pain and arm pain from spending, the, you know, the amount of time that it takes to breastfeed, you yeah. know, during the early weeks. Um, however, when a mother is leaning back and she ideally is in a position where she can relax all her muscles, then suddenly she doesn't really care how many minutes she's doing it. And that is all very much related to milk production. Mm. Um, it, you know, being more relaxed helps with the hormonal release. And also, uh, you know, when a, mo a mother can, let's say, let's say she lies back on her couch and she can watch TV or whatever, or be on her phone while her baby's nursing comfortably, she's not really going to be paying so, such close attention to the clock. And that makes a big difference with regard to early milk production. Right. That makes perfect sense, especially then a relaxed mom, the baby's going to be able to relax better and just everything's right. going to sync up much right. better. The, the, other, the other thing about it is, too, I mean, mothers will often talk about how much work early breastfeeding is. Mm -hmm. And when you can actually get into a position where you can fully relax all your muscles, so much of the work of early breastfeeding just sort of fades away. You know, it becomes, you're able to actually relax while you feed your baby and recover from childbirth. And so, you know, again, a lot of that burden is relieved as well. Right, because so many moms will... Um complain about you know they're resting this is in the first mm -hmm. couple of weeks they're needing to rest and then okay it's time to feed the baby and it like the the feeling around it is it's breaking my rest and they absolutely right. do it because they, they want to feed their baby of course there isn't like a complaint in a horribly negative sense but this method then would allow that relaxation to continue i mean it's different than just um sleeping of course but right. um allow that postpartum recovery to be that much that much better Right. A mother doesn't have to choose between getting her rest and feeding her baby. Mm. She can actually do both at the same time. And that that makes the early weeks tremendously easier. Right. So so um, I also included uh, with the materials I sent you uh, an infographic that I created with a, a local OB mm -hmm. um, that that. It gives a little extra description of these positions to make make it easy for mothers to figure out the adjustments because the adjustments are a little bit different from the sitting up positions they may be used to seeing. So, for example, instead of shoving the baby on the breast, 
like I say, the baby is actually the one that's in charge. And, and the, the adjustments, like I say, she uh, the way she uses her arms are different. And there's basically three adjustments involved in using these natural breastfeeding position. One is adjusting your body, and that would relate to how far back you lean. You know, some mothers find it more comfortable to be, let's say, in like a 45-degree angle. You know, others like to lean back a little more or be up a little bit higher. Um, so that's part of it. And also, as I say, how you use your arms, you want to have pillows under your arms so that, again, you can relax all your muscles. You probably want some head support. Um, the second adjustment is adjust your baby. And the baby can actually come to the breast from all kinds of different angles. You know, when you see the breast crawl, usually the baby is sort of directly on top of the mother's body with the feet down by the mother's thighs. But a baby could be uh, going perpendicular to the mother's body. The baby could be diagonal. The baby can even come up along the mother's side, which can be really useful if the mother's had a cesarean birth and she doesn't want any weight, you know, anywhere near her incision. So there's lots of different ways to position the baby. Um, and then there's also adjust your breast. You know, sometimes mothers with very rounded breasts find it helpful to shape their breasts to make it easier for the baby to latch. So those are the three basic adjustments. Adjust your body, adjust your baby, and adjust your breast. And with your permission, I'll include this infographic for our listeners to access. Is that all right if I include it? Yes. Yes, Great. please do. That we, we want that to be shared freely. Okay, good. It's, it's excellent. I'll make sure that it's there just so people can have a visual along with your, you know, on a podcast, it's all audio. So that helps. As well as I'll play, be putting links to your YouTube channel, which has... Um, so many great um, resources and you know one one of the videos here is answering a question um, that I get a lot or hear um, moms having difficulty with is like trying to well there's two one is like how to get the baby to open their mouth up wide right. how would you how do you yes. answer that question well I think a lot of mothers think that somehow they're supposed to make their baby open wide even perhaps by pushing on the baby's chin or that sort of thing. But the thing to understand is that babies are born with these neonatal reflexes. And if you know how to trigger the reflexes, then it becomes a, a lot simpler. So one of the things we say on the video is your baby's not looking for your breast, you know, like it's a bottle that you're shoving in. Your baby's looking for your body. And it's actually the full body contact of the the face and the, the chest and the, the legs and the feet that actually trigger the right reflexes for a very wide open mouth uh, when the mother is leaning back. So uh, understanding how to use your baby's reflexes to achieve what you want, I think is really key. Right. And that it definitely is the, the feeling behind that question is like, I need to do something to get the baby right. to do it rather than I think what a, the theme I'm hearing here is allowing the baby to do what they're naturally designed to do. Well, to set up the conditions, yes, uh, and yeah. that, that's really the mother's job is to set up the conditions to let the baby do it. I, I also want to mention that we have a, a longer video that actually incorporates many of the shorter clips along with narration, which is a great tool for pregnant mothers. So if a pregnant mom wants to get a little uh, primer on these positions before her baby's born, mm -hmm. um, she can go to naturalbreastfeeding.com, and we have right on the homepage – um, a video that she can click on and watch that actually explains the adjustments that I mentioned. And she can watch uh, a variety of mothers using these positions. These are mothers of different ethnicities and different body types. And she can kind of see how they manage to make it work. So that's, that's a really good preparation before a baby's born. And that's the video, the, the website and the video that you did with Dr. Nesbitt? Exactly, okay, yes. Yeah, She's the, sure the local OB well. who I made the video clips with. Fantastic. Uh, that, the second part of that question about that the moms um, asked me a lot is around like, well, what if the, you know, the baby's fussing and moving around so much? How do right. I, like, what does that mean? I mean, obviously there's differences mm -hmm. there, but um, sometimes moms are thinking I have to like calm the baby. Um, is there anything you recommend there? Well, skin to skin contact is always good, but I think when a baby is struggling, usually it's like the baby's telling you 
there's something that I'm looking for that I'm not finding. And oftentimes, like, for example, when a mother is sitting straight up and holding her baby, oftentimes there's gaps between her body and the baby's body. And if you think about uh, the baby having a, an, a, a GPS sort of built in, um, to, in order to activate that GPS so the baby knows where they are and what to do, they really need full frontal contact. And as I say, it, I mentioned this before, but it, it's, it involves the face and the chest and the feet and the face. Um, you know, all of it needs to feel that contact with the mother's body. So if she leans back and puts the baby on top of her, I think what she'll find is there's a lot less of that unhappiness because now the baby's GPS is activated mm -hmm. and he knows where he is and what to do. Okay. Yeah, that makes perfect sense as well. What, uh, so, and then all these things that we were talking about, different positions and using more of the skin to skin and, um, is that specific to the first couple of weeks only and then you'd switch over to those other cradle football holds or is it just then that becomes another option? Well, it's always an option and many mothers like to continue to use it when it's convenient simply because it's so much less work than the other positions. Right. Um, and of course, a mother's not required to use these positions throughout the early weeks, but I think if she favors them, that she's going to find she has a lot fewer problems than if she tries to use the gravity fighting positions, you know, exclusively. So, for example, you know, the question that I often get asked is, oh, well, what if I go out? Well, first of all, if you go out, actually, there is a way to use these positions. When I'm with at my mother's support group, we actually have regular chairs. And if a mother... Uh, moves her hips forward in the chair and leans back against the back of the chair, she can actually still accomplish these positions. But sometimes, for example, if you're out at a restaurant, you don't necessarily want to use these positions. And that's absolutely fine. I mean, you're not required to use them every single time. It's just that during the early weeks, until a baby gets more head and neck control, it's just a lot easier to use these positions. So up until, usually it's around four to six weeks when a baby starts to get that head and neck control. And this actually corresponds to the period that we used to tell mothers back in the really old days when I first started in breastfeeding, we, got, we had a lot of mothers come to our group who had um, nipple pain and trauma. And before we understood that latch, you know, the depth of latch had anything to do with that, we used to tell mothers, well, just wait four to six weeks and your nipple pain will go away. And it did. And, you know, we used to think erroneously that this was because the, our nipples get toughened up. But, of course, a woman's nipples never get tough uh, and develop calluses like a guitar player's fingers. And it really wasn't about that at all. It was about the fact that at about four to six weeks, babies start to get head and neck control and they can help themselves on deeply mm -hmm. without the mother's help. Thank you very much. So, mm -hmm. you know, eventually that will straighten itself out, even if you do nothing. But you know, why live through pain and trauma in the early weeks when you can avoid it? Right. And that's why we want to have moms like have so much well, education beforehand, but then also support mm -hmm. during those first couple of weeks so that there isn't so much nipple pain and trauma or other latching issues that then prevents them from breastfeeding as long as they want to. Um, right. Because those first couple of weeks can be so impactful one way or another. It could be like, yeah. oh my gosh, I love this so much. I didn't think I would like it as much as I do. And now I'm going to feed for a lot <laughs> longer. I want it. We want that story instead of, right. oh, I really wanted to do a full year, but those first couple of weeks were horrible and I made it to two months and then it was just too much. Right. Well, we, there was one study that we, we uh, refer to on our natural breastfeeding video that I mentioned uh, that actually found that in the first three days, 92% of new mothers who use these sitting up straight gravity fighting positions report significant breastfeeding problems. Mm. And that is a statistic we want to change. Another statistic I can tell you from the research is that um, it, of U.S. mothers, only 33% of them met their goal to exclusively breastfeed for the first three months. So they, they, they surveyed, you know, a large group of women and it's, it's really sad because all of them wanted to exclusively breastfeed for three months, but only one third of them actually got there. Wow. That's a really alarming number. I know it's, it's horrible. And that's why I am so excited about getting this information out to new mothers because just this one change in how they think about early positioning can make such a big difference. I know that many more women will be able to meet their breastfeeding goals if they have this information. One other question that um, I hear from moms too that I'd like to get your opinion on is about uh, switching breasts. 
Like, do you, mm-hmm. are you an advocate for only feeding on one or, you know, flipping at a certain time? How do, how do you address that? Well, there is a strategy that, that is recommended, and it's not based on the clock. I think, you know, if women can remember that breastfeeding has been around a lot longer than clocks, I think it helps <laughs> to understand that clocks really have no place in, when it comes to breastfeeding. Uh, but the strategy that we recommend is something that's called finish the first breast first. And this, what this does is it relies on the baby to come off the first breast on their own and then offer the second breast. Now, what happens when a mother goes by the clock is that the baby may, might not have finished the first breast. And the way breasts, the breasts work is that the, uh, the first breast, the first milk that comes during the feeding is sort of low fat. And then as the feeding progresses, it gets higher and higher in fat. So when the baby reaches a certain point, they will come off the breast. Um, and what happens next is that sometimes babies will take both breasts and sometimes they'll just take one. But if a mother restricts her baby to one breast at every feeding, if, you know, as just sort of a general rule, um, what that has the potential to do is to uh, limit her milk supply because, you know, the baby should ideally be the one who's driving the milk supply. The mother doesn't know, you know, there's no way for her to know exactly how much the baby got. Only the baby knows whether they got enough milk. So following the baby's lead and doing finish the first breast first is, I think, a really good general strategy. There are specific cases where it makes sense to restrict a baby to one breast. That's mothers who have a very large oversupply, for example, who are trying to bring their milk production down. Mm. That can be a really useful strategy. But I've, I've had mothers who actually... Uh, have told me that they were trying to incre- improve their baby's weight gain by restricting them to one breast because they thought they'd get more of the fatty milk. But the problem with that is that the weight gain is really based more on the overall milk volume that they get. Mm-hmm. Um, and so sometimes, as I say, mothers get confused. Um, so it's it, the general strategy that's good for everyone is finish the first breast first. Okay. And, you know, so many other questions that, you know, you as a listener might have um, can be answered through the resources we've already mentioned, but Nancy, I'd love for you to um, mention them once and again about your YouTube sure. channel as well as the other websites that you'd like moms to visit. Okay, well, one of the tricky parts about my resources is that most of them are based on my name, and my name is hard to spell. Yeah. So so it's youtube.com slash Nancy Moorbacher. My, my last name has two H's in it, altogether too many H's, but it's <laughs> Nancy is N-A-N-C-Y, the usual spelling, and the last name is M as in Mary, O-H-R, B as in boy, A-C-H-E-R. So youtube.com slash Nancy Moorbacher. I already mentioned the longer video that's on naturalbreastfeeding.com. And then my website, actually, you, you asked a question about, you know, switching breasts. I actually have a blog post on there. I have um, a listing in the right column of my website that lists all the topics in case you're interested. But it's nancymoorbacher.com is my website. And, and I do have also a breastfeeding resources page on there that has many of my most popular articles, handouts, uh, podcasts, videos, uh, you know, all kinds of things. So, you know, it is a, it does have a lot of resources on it that mothers are, are welcome to, to use. Yeah. And I'll definitely make sure those links are there for you listeners in the show notes, uh, on this episode, as well as on the website, if you're listening through a browser, so you can click into it rather than having to, um, spell it. Um, yeah, also on your, <laughs> that's good. I appreciate also, that. Thank right. you. Also on your website, I um, mentioned the app that you have, the breastfeeding solutions yes. app. Yeah, a, a couple of years ago, I took one of my books for moms called Breastfeeding Solutions, and I turned it into a breastfeeding app uh, called Breastfeeding Solutions. And it is available both for iPhone and Android. And it, um, it basically is a reference. You know, it's an easy reference so that you don't have to rely on Dr. Google, which can be a very unreliable source of information. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it has an index. You can look things up. You know, it has a place you can browse the topics, but I think probably the most innovative part of it is what's what I call the solutions button. And that's if you're having a problem and you're not even sure what it is and you don't know what any of the terminology is, you just press that button and it asks you a few questions and will take you to exactly what it is you're looking for. Like, for example, if you wake up with a sore breast, a lump in your breast, then you know, it'll take you to what is that and what do you need to know about it? So it's, it's just a, it's a, uh, a reliable, trustworthy resource that you can have on your phone all the time uh, just to make it easy for you to find the information that you need. Yeah, and the solutions button is so helpful to have it be, um, 
you, so you don't have to search for mastitis. You could, you could search right. for questions that are, you know, that you would be able to answer in the moment, especially with the sleep deprived brain and, um, yes. you know, and a worried brain of like not knowing what to look for. Whereas you can be prompted to just answer these questions and be fed or, um, directed towards that information so that's right brilliant great job on that design <laughs> oh thank you yeah my, my the idea was I, I didn't want mothers to have to know the terms in order to find what they needed right well in our last minutes here nancy like what is the, what's the major take-home message you'd like uh, a parent uh, or a mom listening to this um to get from what we talked about today well, I'd like her to know that, that breastfeeding is not supposed to be complicated and that in the last 10 years or so, we've learned some new things that has really helped to simplify early breastfeeding. Uh, and I hope she'll take advantage of the resources and, and give that a try. Um, you know, I'd say that that's probably also like if you wanted to give a message to a baby, it's that, you know, we, we now appreciate uh, what babies can do and the fact that uh, we allow them to do what nature programmed in, I think it's good for babies as well as for mothers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that message will one for the moms and then also the babies like is what our listeners are looking for reassurance on of that. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be as complicated as it's being made out to be, or maybe I'm making yeah. it out to be. Um, but then also allowing to follow the innate wisdom that we're all programmed with, but in this day and age, we, tend to override it sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And well, I, I'm not this. denying that breastfeeding was complicated the way we used to teach it. And I'm just thrilled that we've learned enough now to understand that it doesn't have to be that complicated. Right. And I, I applaud you for the work that you've done to be able to help moms. Um, well, I mean, obviously you're traveling all over, teaching all over. You've written books, you're doing this app, like to get this hand, information into the hands of our patients. I know it's helped a ton of um, the women that we serve here at the Cap Wellness Center and obviously ever, ever elsewhere. So I want to thank you for being a part of our show here and sharing that your wisdom with us and uh, for being a part of the podcast. You're very welcome. Uh, thanks, thanks so much for having me. Thank you for joining us today. For more information about this episode and other natural childbirth and parenting topics, please visit us at capwellnesscenter.com or message us on our Facebook page with any questions you might have. We here at the Cap Wellness Center look forward to helping you and your family be as happy and healthy as you can be.